Hello everybody, it's 2 o'clock so we will get started. If you could please uh, maybe finish getting a cookie and some coffee, finding a place to sit. Um, we would like to start on time so that uh, we'll be have some time for conversation and questions after the program. So this is our eighth season of um, history roundtables, and those of us who've been working on it over the years are in shock that the time has gone by that way, but it's been really fun to uh, put these together over the years. This is sponsored by the Bonner Milltown History Center, and we've added a new a couple of words to our name and museum, because thanks to the generosity of mill workers and local residents and and people who aren't either of those. Um, we have been collecting a lot of nice artifacts that now we have on display in our space in the Bonner Post Office building. <coughs> so I hope you'll come and visit and see those when you can. Uh, but let's move forward and get going on our program. Uh, first of all, I'd like to remind you to please silence your cell phones and um, put them on vibrate or whatever you like to do. Um, reminder, there's coffee, cookies. Uh, you're welcome to enjoy these during the program. If you need the restrooms, they're at, on my right, your left. If you go around the sign-in table and down that little hallway, there's the restrooms are back there. Um, we have uh, some displays that we would invite you to look at uh, after the program. And I would like to thank St. Anne Catholic Church and MCAT for making this program possible today. Um, Mike and Steve, who are be giving uh, talks today, are uh, benefactors of the History Center, and they provide the space for us to operate out of, and we truly appreciate that. Our next program will be um, a month from now, February 21st. Scott Keen will be coming to talk about the history of logging in Montana. And without further ado, I would like to call Andy Lukes up, and he will uh, introduce our program. Thanks, Judy. It's fun to see everybody here today, in spite of the weather and the football game, but uh, we'll do our best to make some history locally here. The purpose of these roundtables, as Judy said, is to in better inform the community as to what's going on and, and in terms of its history. Today we're talking about the present, what's happening at the Bonner Mill, because it's a vital part of making history, is today. We cherish the past, we know what happened, we're here today to learn a little more about the present and to help us better understand uh, the future. The future is uh, vitally important to this community and as represented by everybody in the audience today. I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Bame and Steve Nelson. They're the co-developers and owners of the uh, Bonner Mill site. I asked for a, a, a brief biography and I got, well, just give the names and that'll suffice and we'll let them run wild over the audience here, so. Mike, are you up first? Well, I guess so, thank you, Andy. And thank you, community. Uh, what a great, great uh, showing, especially with the football game on today. Steve and I are gonna talk about the mill, uh, the current today, what's going on, and uh, kind of what we hope to be for the future. 
Um, we will certainly take questions. I'm kind of in awe because in this audience is such a history uh, of the mill and we, uh, in fact, if Gary, if you want to go ahead and uh, fire up the computer, we'll just take a look at uh, some of the things that we see coming down the line, but um, also what we're trying to do in, in the short term to make this a, um, a viable operation. Now, Gary showed me how to run this, which is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... It's, well, it's going to take a minute for this to... Come technology, out. don't we love it? Yeah, huh? yeah it's great. Um, I want to get Steve up here because we're going to tag team this. He's going to actually be the fact checker because... I'll embellish things and then Steve will say, well, that's not quite right. So uh, anyway, but we are, we're very pleased to be here, even though Steve would rather be home watching the Broncos win today. They were ahead when I met. Yeah, no, yeah. we don't want to say anything. He because over, so he's, uh, he's taping it, so he doesn't want to hear any scores. <laughs> so I think I'm going to come around to the other side so I can see this a little bit better. Um, this picture, and I will look. Uh, I just grab the roaming mic. All right. This picture actually predates our acquisition. I think this was back uh, when the mill was actually in, in operation. Um, as you can see, the, the plywood building, the portion that um, collapsed in the snow of 2010, is still there, but that's vacant now. So, a little bit about. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think you have to point it as a platform. We practice, honestly. We <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yeah. 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 Oh, thanks. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> All right. When we purchased the mill in basically 2012, December 15th actually, uh, was the closing date. It was uh, a bit scary for us. We purchased 170 acres and uh, 850,000 square feet under roof in seven different buildings. And uh, Gary, this still isn't... Uh, pointed at uh, the oh. laptop. Not working? Ah, there we go. Okay. Uh, the sum of the parts are greater than the whole. And really, that really has to do with the fact that this was a single entity that had a single purpose to produce lumber for various uh, uh, entities. But as we've come to work on the mill, we've found that, well, I think we're up to about seven or eight or even nine tenants on the mill, and they all are doing different types of functions. So the, um, like we said, it's 170 acres on the Blackfoot. It's zoned industrial, so there will not be any commercial properties, um, nor homes on the mill site itself. Uh, it would be quite an endeavor to try and get the zoning changed to, uh, to accomplish that. One of the big selling points of the mill, or a couple of selling points, is the water. We have a lot of water that is part of the water rights that uh, were established back actually in the 1890s. In addition to that, we have a substation, not us, but there is a substation, uh, just over the other side of the river that's 35 megawatts of power available. That is a tremendous asset. In fact, when we were doing our due diligence, we really didn't take that into consideration from the standpoint of, you know, it's not ours, but it, it derives a significant benefit to whoever the tenant uh, is at the mill, or multiple tenants. Um, as you can see there, the, we have water permits enough to supply 42,000 homes, which God forbid we ever have that many in this area. Um, 
rail spurs. That, again, is a very significant benefit to the mill. And then the, um, the fact that we're only a mill or a mile from the uh, freeway. Oops, from the wrong way. One of the things, and I'm going to let Steve step in here because um, I don't want to hog this program. And, and, uh, I don't know if he wants to do some fact checking already, but uh, I'm just going to turn it over to Steve and. What am I going to talk about? Well, uh, you can talk about this slide, which you've never seen. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, a couple things. Uh, one of the questions that I think we got when we first started this process, are you hearing me okay? Yeah. Okay. So one of the first things, that, or one of the things that we were asked to talk about is why did we even do this in the first place? And uh, uh, then I think Mike and I generally agreed uh, what, what what our motivation was. Number one, obviously, we thought we could make some money at it, but we were probably at a time of our lives when, uh, you know, we had done okay and we felt like as though that uh, this was a project that we could afford, uh, maybe, and, uh, and then it was uh, obviously something we thought that we could really, in, in the latter part of our lives here, maybe do that would be pretty exciting and, and uh, maybe we could make a lot of money, but we also thought it might be something we could do for our community and that's you know we kind of used to consider ourselves Missoulians and and now we're a little bit more leaning towards being uh, Bonnerites or whatever you want to call us but uh, uh, we just saw it as a really op a real neat opportunity to not only help ourselves but do something for the community uh, I just want to say too uh, without the uh, I think the backing and the and the cooperation and the, and the support that we've gotten from <coughs> you folks in this community, uh, we probably wouldn't be where, where we are today. There's many of you out here, and I, I recognize several of you, that have come to uh, meetings and talked to us and helped us and pointed out things that we really didn't know much about. And uh, I know there's a collective amount of knowledge here that we've been at it about five years or coming up five years now. And, we don't even scratch the surface compared to what many of the folks that are in this room that know a lot more about it than we do. Some of it we don't want to know about, but uh, <laughs> a lot of the stuff uh, we do want to know and we do appreciate it. Uh, so just to talk, uh, maybe we'll just talk in, in segments here a little bit, but to talk about uh, environmental issues. Uh, as you all know, there was, uh, Stimson had a, a, a champion International Paper had a major cleanup uh, that they needed to do out here at the site, and it was mainly PCBs. And uh, they have done the majority of that at this point. Uh, they probably have spent seven million dollars cleaning up, and you know better than I do, but the old fire pond kind of in back of the where the boilers were and behind the sawmill. Now you'll notice, and I don't know whether you have or not, but there's some more construction <coughs> activity going on over there. There's a bunch of uh, uh, a big excavators and at the end of uh, last year they thought they were just about done and and thanks to some of our folks uh, uh, maybe some in this room but we we had heard and found out that there were probably some more uh, PCBs in an area there so we in conjunction with Stimson discovered that there were uh, some additional PCBs so they uh, have agreed along with uh, champion to come in and, and uh, excavate that out. And that's right where the old compressor building, some of you I think called it the powerhouse, but it was right directly behind the, the two big uh, uh, boilers there, the big wood boilers. And uh, so they'll dig about a 35 foot hole <laughs> and it'll probably cover probably 200 feet in diameter around that area where they'll be. They hope to be done with that by, in the next couple of months, the main part of the excavation. Some of that is fairly high level, so it'll have to be taken to Mountain Home, Idaho. The rest of it will be taken up to the landfill here, and then it'll be refilled with uh, clean uh, 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 fill. Uh, one other step that we're hoping to take this, this year, and you'll see that coming, and we're working on it right now, and that is uh, when Stimson left the last time, there was a fairly large uh, pile out there. We call it the, uh, the, the repository, but it's 2.3 acres. And uh, if you look, you know, as you look past the guard shack down towards the sorter building, it's that big uh, uh, pile of dirt there. Well, we hope that this spring, that, or early summer, 
I don't know how fast the wheels will turn, but we're, the whole plan is to have that removed and taken to the uh, landfill. Because there are still small parts or, uh, of PCBs in there, and uh, we don't want it there. I don't think you folks want it there. And I know the county commissioners and the county in general don't want it there. So we're able to do that through, uh, we created a, a tax increment finance district. I'm sure all of you know about that. Or, but basically, uh, as the, the development has, has matured, there's been more taxes created. And you're allowed to use some of that money to do some things like this to finish cleaning up this property. And uh, so right now, we're in the process. Monday, I should have some bids in from an engineer to tell us how to go about it. We've got a pretty good idea. And then we'll be able to put that out to bid. And we now think there's enough revenue in the tax increment to be able to bond or to fund this over a 15-year period to get that moved out of there. And so we're, we're pretty excited about that. Uh, probably from an environmental standpoint, that kind of takes care of, of, of that area. One, one thing that's kind of un environmental that you probably know about or will talk about for just a minute, and that is the, uh, we have uh, gathered with some other folks, uh, some in this room, to uh, try to create a, uh, a sewer district for this community out here. It'd be West Riverside, Bonner, the whole thing. There's, it's a little bit controversial, not everybody's excited about it, but the fact of the matter is, at some point, we've got to get everybody off of uh, these little uh, uh, septic tanks and seepage pits and things that, that some of the places have, because we have a fairly high concentration of uh, homes uh, throughout this area. So through uh, some volunteer funding from uh, uh, well, we gave some money, some other people some money. I think they raised fifty, sixty thousand dollars, and they're going to do a uh, preliminary engine, engineering report. And essentially, what that does is they just go out and find out what really should be done, what can be done, and some ballpark idea of what it might cost. It, it, it's four or five years before this could happen, but but sewer for this entire community out here would be a big deal, wouldn't? It wouldn't mean annexing. I know that would be, you know, beyond anybody's uh, uh, wishes. And, and I <coughs> do. we think we could maybe do one out here and have a, uh, a district or a community district out in this area that would be we could manage or however we wanted to go about it. But it's just a first step to find out what's going on with that. So that's one of the things that's happened. Uh, that's <coughs> probably about all I got as far as environmental issues and that sort of thing. Okay. You want to go next or you want me to keep going? Go ahead. You're on a roll. Well, I, um, I guess you I know, knew when I gave him a mic, I would you know. <laughs> um, and, and I think one of the, at, at, at this meeting at Bruce Hall, you ought to talk a little bit about this park that, uh, that is out here. I think that would be something that would be kind of fun to talk about because we've had a lot of discussions about that and that's kind of an exciting project. But maybe if we just take a minute, I'd, I'd like to run you through the, the what we've got out there and then maybe a little bit about what some of the future, the future is that, that we're thinking might come about. Uh, and when I get to, uh, well the first thing I'll do is when we first started the mill we had one tenant on site, and that was Northwest Paint. And uh, they, as you well know, paint uh, concrete siding and, and wood siding. It's a pre-finished product so that they can sell it to places where the painting season isn't as long. They've been there since day one. They ended up buying uh, uh, their property, the part of the, uh, the old uh, uh, plywood building from us. And that's, uh, Brick Fred is the owner there, and he couldn't make it today, but he extended the best to everybody. Uh, they've probably got 35 people working there. He was just at a big show in Las Vegas last week. He's got some cautiously optimistic, exciting kind of things going forward. He thinks he's picked up some new customers, and so we're really excited about that. He runs a great operation over there. He's got about 120,000 square feet that he owns, and then he leases uh, about 40,000 more from us. So. He's kind of in a growth mode, and we're, we're really excited about that. The, the very next tenant we got was uh, uh, Hellgate Forge. And 
uh, Darren, and Darren's here, and I'm gonna, if it's all right, Darren, when I get, I'm just gonna stop here for a minute when I get done telling a little bit, and then I'll let you talk about what you're doing. But they uh, took over to most of you folks, it's the machine shop, and then there was the carpenter shop and the pipe shop. There are those three buildings that are right near the warehouse building. I, everybody kind of know where I'm talking about. And still on the outside, if you look at them, they're not, uh, they're not very pretty yet, and we have plans for that. But Darren's done a ton of work on the inside of them, and he has a, a forge business, and then he's expanding that a little bit. And Darren, maybe just if I could, uh, Darren, just stand up if you want to, I'll hand you the mic, and then maybe, you're probably really used to these microphones and talking oh, yeah. in front yeah. of the group, so talk to him. Oh, talk a little boy. bit about Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Darren Wicks, and I originally uh, just a plain and simple blacksmith. Uh, we need to do expand a couple years, and I, uh, even before these two fellas <laughs> took over the site, we were we were interested in uh, looking at the warehouse when when other people were uh, when Stimson was getting out. When they took over, we uh, contacted them and uh, made a deal on the those three buildings. And since moving there, things uh, as they do, they change and. Uh, some of our forge market has 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 left because of the economy, but uh, things picking up also. Uh, we've done work for Alcom on site. Uh, Coaster Pedicabs is another company. Um, we we had built-in uh, customers on site, which is a really nice thing having your cust your uh, your customers be your neighbor. So we looked into buying a abrasive water jet. And it's a computer numeric controlled CNC machine. It's like a, a milling machine, but it, it uses garnet abrasive to cut uh, any material up to five by 10 and seven inches thick. So we, uh, we had our customers on site and we've been working around the Missoula community and uh, it's, it's pretty exciting finding out what's, what's out there, what your potential customers are. And I, I would, I may be wrong, but I would venture to say that uh, through uh, uh, that machine and, and, and the work that he's done inside, I bet you've spent a couple hundred thousand dollars in that property. Uh, I don't like to Well, I know, I know you don't. We don't like to either, but to, to upgrade that facility, and he's kind of building it from the inside out, but we are going to uh, try to get some paint on those buildings this, uh, this summer, and uh, and, and, and make it, you know, look even better. Uh, so just to continue on just a little bit, we've, everybody I think knows about Willis Enterprises. That's the logging operation where they uh, have uh, a, a big chipping operation uh, estimating, but I think he spent in the neighborhood of five to seven million dollars between the extension of the railroad building the chipping plant and uh, they had to put in a new scale, uh, all the other things they've done there. I've talked to them just recently and they're very excited about the future. They think that uh, that they'll continue. I think they're running about 12 uh, rail cars a day out of there with chips. Uh, they've got about 15 people working there, 12 to 15, and I would guess there's probably 50, 60 or more uh, indirect jobs uh, with the logging folks and that sort of thing that are uh, directly affected by what they're doing. So we're really excited about them. They're great people. Uh, then we have. Uh, Go right ahead. Thank you. All right. I didn't know how this was going. So. Long-winded. All right. <laughs> well, we we play off each other pretty well. We've been partners for about 18 years. Yeah. Yeah. So, good times and bad. Anyway, uh, Montainer, and by the way, we have a gentleman here that represents Montainer. Uh, I'll be very honest with you. When they came to us with their idea it's like oh my god what are they doing <laughs> they take these shipping containers and I'm sure you know you see them going by on the on the rail carts and they convert them into living quarters and I mean these things are beautiful but it's like well where are they gonna sell these I mean would you want to live in a container well I'll tell you there's a lot of people that do and uh, They've got a great backlog of orders. In fact, um, 
uh, there's discussion they're in a small space in in the planar building in the low portion but um, they want to move over into the sorter building because uh, they're growing that that fast in fact um, I'm gonna give Patrick a couple of minutes here don't be too long-winded not like <laughs> my partner okay and if you want to just talk I'll, we'll hold you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Another one. Can you, uh, uh, Patrick, uh, you, you want to get it up on the board? Somewhere? I would like to. I how do you do that? that. Um, you know I how can, to do it? Yeah, if I could just get into my, is that, that's controlled by a computer back there. I'll just, I'll just get right, right, right there. Right there. Oh, right there. Yeah. Right there. yeah. All right, guys. Yeah. So you All work right. on that and we'll keep going. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we'll keep going. Um, and I think most of you know about Alcom, the trailer manufacturer. You know, we look at the inventory that they have and how many they build. They build 20, 25 trailers a day. I mean, it's incredible, their output. Um, and Steve and I are going, everybody in America has to have a trailer by now. I mean, so many that they're putting out. But they uh, currently, I think, employ about 140 people. They started out with about 20, 25. Um, they anticipate with, the, and they've actually doubled in size. They're in the barrel portion of the plywood building, and their first um, portion was the first barrel, and that's about 75,000 square feet. And then um, almost, well, about nine months ago, we went ahead and refurbished the other side of the barrel, and now they have about 150,000 square feet, and um, they're just they got they've just started doing horse trailers and. I mean, it's it's phenomenal what they're able to do and what they're pushing out. That doesn't look like mine. Um, oh, sorry, guys. No, that's okay. No problem. Our the the newest tenant that we have, um, other than the brewery, which we'll talk about that, uh, is Coaster Pedicab. Now, we have redone the bottom floor of of the old um, warehouse building. And I'll tell you, it looks beautiful. If you get an opportunity to go over, you know, just stop in and tell them we sent you. But um, they build these pedicabs. And what they are, is, it's think of a rickshaw. Only this would probably be a rickshaw on steroids because they are built out of steel and aluminum. They're very high tech and they just transport people. But the big selling point, or actually the, the big, uh, Revenue point for pedicab is the advertising that they sell on the on the pedicab and they have several big contracts uh, around the country They claim that um, that they're going to take over that entire building um, Within the next couple of years and I don't doubt it because they are very aggressive and they've got a great product and they are really uh, really moving forward um, actually, they, the originator, they're actually 11 years old, and they were doing some contract work with a company down in Darby uh, that would build parts for the machine, but uh, one of their people relocated here to kind of work on the assembly of that, and then the Darby facility uh, closed up, so they needed a, a spot to build these, um, these pedicabs. And so they have them in New York, Chicago, um, <coughs> big cities, and they just transport people. And they recently are they're working with um, United Parcel Service, uh, and this is kind of where the synergy, Darren had mentioned it a little bit, the synergy in, in the mill that you have a Hellgate Forge and you have a pedicab, but he can do work for pedicab and they can walk across the street. Same thing goes with Alcom and Pedicab. United Parcel Service came to them and said, we would like you to build us a, uh, a transporter. In other words, so in busy cities, you know, congested with traffic and, and so forth, that they can have a box on the back of a pedicab and they can do their deliveries. Now, this has tremendous potential and they're just in the very early stages of, of uh, following through on this but again and then Alcom builds the boxes for pedicab so 
I mean, it's it's a great little synergy that goes on. How are they powered? I'm sorry. How are they powered? By pedal, oh. just like a rickshaw. <laughs> You're they riding. They have some that will have a little assist on there, the uh, power assist. They've started. They've got some like that. Yeah. They are they are amazing. Um, gee, Patrick, thanks a lot. <laughs> No, that's okay. We're no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should have known better. Anyway, uh, the brewery, Kettle House. They purchased 18 acres in the old East Log Yard, and they are in the process of building a 50,000 barrel brewery. Now, and I wish Tim were here because they have a a, a fantastic vision for the future for that plot of land. land. Um, the, um, the brewery itself is about 25,000 square feet. They should hopefully by mid to late summer be brewing out of there. But they, their vision, and I, I don't hopefully want to put words or in, uh, in what their plans are, but um, they hope to make that kind of an event center where there can be weddings, where there can be, let's say, small music concerts, venues, um, and also they would like to make it a, 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 a portage point off the river for canoeists and, and people that are floating the river to come in and enjoy a brew and go down and hit the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Uh, have I missed anybody? Tell them about the 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 Alicon or and the the um, brewery the the connection with them. I remember reading about it in the paper. Don't they have some connection with the, them working together? Well, Coaster and Kettle House. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Coaster and, and, yeah. and I think what you're talking about is in the paper there was uh, some discussion about another company coming that. Is a is like a fertilizer. Oh company. right, right. Yes. And they were going to use the the leftover mash from the brewery, and but we don't we 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 heard in the newspaper they're coming, but we haven't heard. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's amazing what the Missoulian puts out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. We love the Missoulian. All right, and I will. I'll I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, one more thing, I just want to briefly mention. Uh, is that we're working with a company. Um, we do not have any signed contracts yet, hopefully fairly soon, uh, that is going to take a portion of the planer building, uh, a fairly major portion of the planer building. So we've uh, got our fingers crossed that that's going to happen. I guess one other company that I forgot to mention is um, Water Transfer and Storage. It's a storage company that um, um, they do, you know, on-site storage. They you know, they store automobiles and boats and motorhomes and so forth, but their primary mission is to receive uh, shipment via rail and they will unload it and they'll either store it or they'll deliver it locally. Uh, there really isn't a, um, uh, a facility of, of that nature between Billings and, and Spokane. And uh, so they're hoping to get that off the ground and get it up and going. That doesn't look like my slide. <laughs> Do you want to talk, Patrick? Yeah. Okay, you're ready, huh? Okay. Yeah, I'll just be really quick. Um, but uh, yeah, we built these houses out of shipping containers, and um, yeah, we started out um, just with one yellow container, and we actually featured it in downtown Missoula. Uh, Oh yeah, and so some of you guys might have seen it, um, and then we took it to Seattle uh, from there, <laughs> and we started taking pre-orders. This was a little bit over a year ago, and um, these two that we just delivered are the first two of uh, a long string of pre-orders that we took, uh, started taking over a year ago, um, and we're shipping these out all over the country. We build them here in Montana. Um, and we ship them out to where housing is really expensive. Places like Seattle, uh, San Francisco, 
we've got one that's going to San Diego that's in production right now. Um, and so I can just flip through these pictures and you can, oh, 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 does that, oh, it, yeah, because it, it's in my email, it doesn't, oh, it doesn't oh. quite work like that. So, um, but, um, so this is one that we shipped out to Brewster, Washington. It's just a single uh, red cabin, um, really basic. Um, and we just, we built it out at the mill uh, and then we literally just installed it in one day. We just craned it right onto the foundation. <laughs> and um and it was it was uh, ready to live in by the end of the day <laughs> which was pretty cool um and this is a two container model a, a double wide essentially that we just um installed in olympia washington um that's that's actually me right there <laughs> holding that string <laughs> and um so yeah we're uh you know we're a small company um, but we do have some rather big ambitions so um they literally just transport down the road just like any shipping container does except for they've got a built out house inside of them and so um, that's uh, kind of a finished exterior photo um, and they, they just go on permanent concrete piers just like uh, uh, a lot of other houses do and um, a big part of what we do for our customers as well as we go through the entire permitting process for process for them so um, there's the inside got some good interiors so yeah they're really they're really nice inside so on the outside it's a recycled shipping container and then on the inside it's um it's a you know rather nice house so, you know, so. so yeah pretty <laughs> they're pretty they're pretty structurally sound yeah <laughs> so well, they ra they range. Um, that that first single one I just uh, put up there is about 200 square feet, um, and then this one here is a 650 square foot two bedroom house. So, um, and then we've got several. We've got another one that's um, larger than this. It's a three container one we're building out right now, and um, and then we've got uh, several others that are going to be going into production that are over a thousand square feet. So. Um, you can build any size of house when you start connecting the, the modules together. So yeah, so that's that's all I had to say. But I wanted to see pictures. Patrick, picture stuff. Patrick yeah. awesome. Yeah, thanks. Guys. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. They are they are neat. They really are. And uh, uh, he didn't mention one, but they have an order for one in New York City. Yep. yep. Can you believe it? Yeah. Anyway. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit, well, first of all, I guess before we get to the future of the mill, but also want to talk about the houses a little bit. Um, when we purchased the mill, it also included, there's 16 homes on the, uh, on the mill side or on uh, the mill side of Highway 200. And they were pretty dilapidated, to say the least. We had gotten a couple of bids from a couple of contractors and they said well we can do it for this but in reality you probably should just tear them down and start over but we really got to looking at the homes specifically on the inside I mean these homes were built like a brick you know what they are um, you know the lumber is all straight and true it was built by a lumber company so you know that they you know there was a lot of craftsmanship that went into these so and the, the person here, or who is not here, who is largely responsible for turning them into the gem that they are. Um, in fact, I've got, um, let's see. The 26 homes, let's jump across the street for a second where the post office is and those 26 homes on, on that side. Uh, we purchased those in 2012. Uh, out of bankruptcy um, they had um, and they were in, in pretty rough shape too but they were all occupied as they are today as people move out um, we try and go in and, and do a lot of rehab on the interior there's still a lot of work left to be done um, on those homes and we will get to them as our financing <laughs> Is, uh, is available and, and also um, our chief builder and 
bottle washer, Mike Heisey, who has just done an incredible job with rehabbing the, the homes. Um, are any of those homes individually owned? No, they are not. They're all rentals. Some of you may remember if you drove up 200 what these homes looked like before we uh, rehabbed them. They're in pretty sad shape. Um, they were decommissioned by the mill, I believe, in 2008. And anything that is relative to history, a lot of you will know much more than Steve or I. So. But anyway, we went through and rehabbed them, and all 16 homes are currently rented, and, and um, they just, people love it out here. Right? There seems to be a real attraction uh, to Bonner. I know, you know, that people have pets, they have a yard, and uh, they just seem to, we have a waiting list for people to rent these houses. Visions. Visions for the mill. Um, you know, when we started out, people would say well what what's your business plan what you know what are you going to do and we were like we're gonna let people tell us what they think or what they can use what what best suits them because when we have as much square footage under roof and we know that you have a building that's 300,000 square feet like the planer building it's gonna be multiple tenants there's, you know, it, and there's just, it's just a difficult building. It's beautiful. You walk in there and it just, it takes your breath away. At one point in time, it was the largest wood structure in North America. And I think it's still up in, in, that, uh, in that category. But um, our immediate plans are to kind of partition that building, uh, you know, so we can uh, put multiple tenants in there. Um, also, as Steve mentioned, we are working with uh, the county and trying to get that um, uh, repository uh, removed. And then beyond that, it's painting and some landscape work that we can do just to make it more attractive. Um, and then one of the things that we're kind of, I guess, wrestling with right now is to try and find a client for that uh, White House. I mean, that's a beautiful old building but it's uh, you know it's probably an office building well it's kind of hard to attract you know clients to come out and, and uh, open an office in that building but we have hopes and beyond that we're open for business we just um, you know we love to hear feedback we we're very amenable to well, I'll tell you what, we I have a saying, you kiss a lot of frogs before you find that prince, and we've kissed a lot of frogs. We've had some very wild ideas that people have wanted to do. So, anyway, now we're open for discussion. Let me just, before you oh. just a couple of things I wanted to uh, mention to you. Uh, you know, you look at this, if, if you took it overhead now, there would be lots of white, because uh, the planer building, that's 300,000 feet, but we put a new roof on that. Uh, the plywood building where the uh, uh, Alcom is, we haven't got it completely white, but the whole barrel, uh, the, the valley, and then up to the uh, pitch of the roof on both sides is now white. Uh, Britt has done a fair amount over on his section where he's at, and then we've done quite a bit too on the, on the low area. And as Mike mentioned, we're hoping we've got the paint now, you, you see the one end of the building down there that's got painted grain, green, and we hope that uh, by the end of the summer we'll have a lot more green paint. We own, we own the, the paint, now we just got to get the time to put it together. And I just wanted to take a, a minute, you know, Mike talked about, and I, I might get in trouble for this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, the folks that we're talking about, this, we really believe this is, uh, this, uh, it's a data center is what it is, and I, I really can't get into the details about it, but the thing that's exciting about it, uh, and, and Mike mentioned it in the opening remarks, there's all this power available, and you know we really didn't know that that might be important, but for these kind of people, it's critically important. They need to have, uh, they're gonna probably start out with five or eight megawatts power to run what their, their first phase of their operation, but they could get to 35 to 50 megawatts, and 
because of this mill and because of stone container and all those going down, there's probably 80 to 100 megawatts of power in this valley that's just kind of languishing and it's available. Uh, the rate of power because of uh, hydroelectric and, and all that, uh, it just became a real uh, focal point for these folks that are from California. They've looked all over the country. I can tell you, we, they didn't just happen on us. They, they looked everywhere and they looked at anybody that had lots of power and big buildings and that you could get it quickly and that's kind of that's kind of what's going on here so we really believe that uh, something you know they're spending money we can tell you that right now they haven't given us very much yet but we've we've gotten a little bit and uh, they have contracted with electrical engineers here in town uh, CTA architects HDR is another engineering firm uh, they've uh, spent some money on an electrician to fly him down to their place to look and see what they're doing. So, fingers crossed, but it really looks like it's something that uh, could happen. And initially, it's going to be more of a data center and probably not a lot of job creation, maybe 10, 12 jobs. But they've become pretty enamored with what they're finding here. And uh, they're talking about moving their manufacturing facility that then could be 75 to 100 jobs. And uh, so, so we're pretty excited about all that. So now we'll just turn it over to questions. So anybody, you have a question. Yes. Yeah, um, I might comment that in addition to water and power, you also have a major fiber optic ring right down in the middle of Main Street, which is a big fiber optic. And to comment on that, it's now in our site, uh, down to our DMARC, which is on the far corner, heading towards the river of the Planer building. It just got put in, uh, well, uh, Friday and uh, so we've got fiber there and it's going to end up at Alcom because they do a lot of transfer of uh, uh, well plans and that sort of thing that takes up a lot of data so it'll one of the reasons they're doing it is to go to Alcom and then uh, Northwest Paint will probably use the fiber and then uh, Charter is also bringing we've got CenturyLink there now but Charter is also bringing uh, uh, cable and uh, and copper to the same area, so uh, Pedicab will be able to use that. But very good point. Yeah. Uh, my question was: uh, Have you considered any kind of incubator space uh, for new business startups, ventures, entrepreneurs to? <laughs> well, it, they kind of have it already. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> absolutely. And, and <laughs> we, you know, we have it. We had a fairly long conversation, and I won't get the guy's name right, but. The gentleman that operates the ME, well, whatever, the incubator at the university down on Broadway, he came out and they looked at the White House and they, we just didn't get any traction and it's certainly something we ought to be looking at. But Patrick's right, we've, we, we have those little kinds of things that, you know, if you drive into the planer building, you'll look around and you'll see all these different guys in each corner doing stuff. And, uh, you know, and I think, we were pretty fair in the way we started you guys out and because uh, you know we just uh, see what you can do and now they're paying some decent rent and we hope to get more rent out of them so yeah good idea oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> it'd be perfect and we probably need to revisit that the reverend <laughs> oh, you actually answered my question. I was wondering when this tap room and brewery is going to open up, but I see that your slide says uh, summer of this year. Well, just the production. Oh, okay. Their total, f you know, and we're probably getting ahead of ourselves a little bit talking about a tap room and, and events. I mean, that's a 20 year vision, I think, for those folks. Okay. What they want to do today is they want to brew beer, especially cold smoke. and. Uh, I don't know whether you noticed, but you know that road now that takes off over there? It's now called Cold Smoke Lane. Yeah. Uh, but, but anyway, yeah, they, they want to produce beer because they just aren't producing enough of it. And I think that'll be the focus for the next uh, few years is just making sure they produce a lot of beer. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say that I'm really glad that somebody like you guys took bought this property. I lived at Stevensville. Uh, I'm really into history, but uh, and I grew up in a mill town in New England. But uh, I'm really glad that guys like you are, are doing this, and uh, I'm really impressed. Uh, uh, yeah, watching the Bonnard history through the Missoulian, and uh, and I thought, oh, this guy came in and bought the town, and oh, what the heck's going to go? It's going to be Missoula Junior or something, but. You guys are doing really good. You're really conscientious, and 
And uh, anyway, yesterday uh, I got a good friend of mine who's just started <coughs> got another business. But uh, if anybody in here is a wood, wood, wood a serious woodworker, um, he just brought in a uh, nice load of cherry wood uh, from back in Pennsylvania. That's in the smallest. It goes from 20 to 30 inches wide and uh, 10 foot long. Beautiful stuff. He wants to get a hold of every woodworker I know because uh, he he's, he's got a good price on it. But um, yeah, I we pull, I pulled up to that security sure. station there in the by the gate, which is really good that you guys got security. Uh, <laughs> But uh, anyway, he let me in and he said, follow me. And we went into the warehouse and uh, it was the middle of the day and all of a sudden my day vision became pitch black. And uh, I was following his taillights through the darkness. It was unbelievable. Uh, I didn't know where I was going. And, uh, I didn't want him to get too far ahead of me. And he was, he was in the far corner, but he, he turned on the lights and uh, it took a while the lights come on. And it, uh, gosh, I was impressed with the space in there, and being a woodworker myself, you know, the first thing I saw was the posts and the yeah. beams and yeah. everything. Yeah. <clears throat> and then I saw the, yeah, the electrical, uh, the conduits, the panels, I mean, you got all kinds of power there, and uh, it's just really impressive, and I'm, like I said, I'm really glad someone like you guys, and you know, I have appreciation for this town. Thank you. I'd like to get a recording of that. <laughs> Next time we go to the county commissioner. Bruce, go. <laughs> I was just curious of the status of the four bridge trains, these uh, 100-foot-wide trains. They're in there. Yeah, they're in there. Uh, somebody, before we got there, uh, I think the copper that they ran on for the power, they, somebody scalped that out of there. But they, if you hook a pigtail up to them, which we did when we put all the new lights in that building, you can they'll move up and down the the rail and operate they they will it's i think the the issue i think for these guys for uh, patrick they're going to be i think it's going to be something that he'll be able to use for sure and but they operate uh we just haven't found anybody that you know needed them at this point what do you advertise for new potential customers do you advertise or well, a little bit. We uh, we have uh, a realtor uh, who advertises on a. Uh, you guys that are in real estate probably know, but it's called LoopNet, and it's a commercial, industrial, nationwide, and you can put it on there and say uh, you're in California and you're looking for a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand square feet, and you're looking for power and water and those kinds. Of, it'll probably show up on there, and you can refine your search. And I think that's, we're pretty sure that's how we found out, or found the, uh, the folks that are looking at us as a data center. But probably our absolute best is uh, what uh, we, well, it's the Missoula Economic Partnership. They, it's our economic development group in the city of Missoula or the county of Missoula. And they have feelers out all over. They take lots of calls in from the state and from this area. and. Uh, that's where we're getting, we got Alcom, we've picked up some, I think Pedicab really came through those folks, so we've, we've been really lucky that way. This How much square footage do you currently have waste out or sold? Out of the 850, probably 500,000. Yeah, yeah. About 500,000 that's either sold or, and uh, if, you know, we could get this other company in here, they, I think they'd start out at about 120,000 feet. And, uh, and literally, we should know something in the next couple of weeks. I mean, it, it's, it's that close. Back in the corner. You mentioned something about phones you have for the park. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I'm going to actually let, maybe I'll just turn it over to Bruce, but uh, you're talking about the park uh, that the Bonner Development Group has. Oh, yeah. I, Bruce, you want to just could answer I, this could question? I say one yes. Thing? Yes. Um, I'm here because I've been involved in history forever, and I live in Cedar Lake. And you can't live in Cedar Lake and come to Missoula as often as I come to Missoula and know the bond and the, and the um, equal personalities and the interest of history that's tied us forever. Um, but coming through here and watching what's happened to that mill site, and the terror that we've had, even up there, you know, that here's a, a, a sister, brother neighborhood to us, 
and, and what was you faced. And to gather this support and this vision and, and really never give up, um, it, it's a real um, testimony to all of us. And it, it's Could so exciting to be here. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. It, 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 it is, it's, it's, it's humbling. I mean, I, I well up a little bit when I think about it sometimes. I, it's, it's incredible. And he never will. Oh, I do. <laughs> Somebody help, real quick. Uh, Montana's uh, kind of famous for their equipment, uh, equipment tax as uh, being maybe a deterrent to some industries coming to Montana. Is that a problem for the data center, or do you see it a problem for your uh, Not so much us, uh, but I think it is a challenge for the uh, for the data center. But when you really dig down deep into it, you know. I came back to Missoula in 1980 and I started a restaurant that didn't go very well in town called the Savoy Restaurant. At that time, the uh, business equipment tax was 13%. And uh, we paid uh, back, and that was a long time ago, but I remember we got our first bill, it was $30,000. We we, we'd lost $30,000 by that time, and we still had to pay that bill. Today, it's down to 3%, but you get, uh, and I won't get into total details about it, but you get some credits to start with. Uh, I think it's up to five, six hundred thousand dollars, the first five, six hundred thousand. And then the next is, a, is, is graduated. And then they have a sliding scale as far as the depreciation of those things. It's a, it's a revenue builder for the, for the state of Montana, but when we talked to those folks and we were open to it, we told them about it. And uh, you know, it's just, it's just part of doing business because they're coming from California and they're paying a lot more down there than they are here. So we're getting in the right direction of that business equipment tax and every legislature seems to talk about cutting it back a little bit more and I think it's a, something that needs to happen, you know, to get it less because it is kind of a deterrent. One question. You didn't mention or you guys haven't mentioned is the Harris Thermal Properties over there, was that part of your purchase? Oh, okay. okay. So this isn't part. Nope. Don't even bring it up. Okay. <laughs> but we know a little bit about it. I mean, they built this big, beautiful building and uh, and had great ideas. But that was when oil was a hundred bucks a barrel. And their main, the reason they bought that, according to what they told us, is that because they couldn't come up through the lock saw with their uh, large loads. Uh, they thought, well, we'll just get on the other side of the problem, which they did. That, that part worked out fine. Then oil drops to $33 or $31 or whatever dollars a barrel, and, and, the, and where their focus is is in Alberta. And so I think they've got four or five people over there, and that's it. Yeah. yeah. I think at some point they probably will crank back up if, if the market's there. But I think it was, it's been a pretty tough deal for them right now. I was browsing the net online. There was a company called Montana Grow. Uh, they packed it, and I looked for the location that showed it over here. Are they still over there with you folks, or? Well, <laughs> they are, uh, and don't want to talk too much for them. Or, but it's a uh, silica-based. Uh, I think they call it a fertilizer, and they do have some good ideas. They're. It, it works? Oh, man. Yeah. And, and I live in a little gulch, and I had squash. I, I cannot raise Hubbard squash. I had Hubbard squash just to be around. Wow. Well, you know, John Porterfield is the uh, principal. They're working at it. Uh, I think they're just struggling raising funds. They'd like to, they've got a mine down here by uh, Bearmouth, and it's called Ignib Ignimbrite. Is the, and then they grind it up and they make this uh, fertilizer and well, they ship. You mix it with, uh, to make it work, you mix it with, uh, without getting too much detail, you, you mix it with blood meal and your yeah. bone meal. Yeah. And when you put those three together, it's phenomenal. It sounds like it's an essential part of plant growth. And uh, anyway, we're, we've, we've been riding with them and we've been working with them. And, uh, you know, at one time we thought they were going to take over the whole building down there. We thought they had some funding and then that fell apart, and so now we've got them in a corner, and so we're, we got our fingers crossed for them. We're hoping it'll work out. Any more questions? Bruce. Bruce, Bruce you only get two. 
I, I really, oh, sorry, but I appreciate the, all, the, all the things you're doing for the community. You're involved in a lot of different ways. And uh, just thinking that you, I, I'm sure you got a lot of visions of other things, and I kind of wondering if there's a, any kind of vision for bon, uh, for the Milltown area to, you know, to, to the south of you, anything to the south of you. Is there, we don't own any of that. I realize, <laughs> I realize that. I just, Bruce, no. Well, maybe a couple. Uh, one of the things we're working with, is there anybody here from North Milltown Homeowners here? But anyway, the folks that are uh, down on that, what we call the uh, Southwest, you know, those, there's about 30 homes down there. Uh, we've had a, a, an agreement to provide them water, uh, clean water, because they, way back when in the 70s, they had some uh, wells that were affected and so we, but we've been working with them to try to come up with a way to uh, create a permanent solution from a water standpoint for them. And, and I think Stimson is going to come to the table and uh, U.S. Plywood or Champion is going to come to the table a little bit to help them out and we're going to come to the table and try to make that a better situation for them. I think the biggest thing, uh, not to get too much on my bandwagon, but I think the best thing we can do uh, is if there would be some way to create some kind of a sewer system, and I'm talking about a community sewer system for this area out here. Bruce and I, you and I have talked about that uh, for, at length, but I think it, it's going to cost some money a little bit for sure. Not, not, it's going to cost a lot, but individual owners, it's not going to be, I don't think, onerous. But if we could get that for this uh, Bonner, West Riverside, uh, Milltown, all that area, I think it would Number one, it's it's really the right thing to do. You shouldn't be, you know, we're just dumping this sewage into the ground, and it's it, it's probably not the best thing to do, especially if you've got your well just downstream, not very far. But we've got we're fortunate. We've got this really great aquifer, and our ground is so porous that we're getting away with it up to this point. But we're not forever, and I think that'll increase property values and do some great things for the community. And to me, that would be the best thing. Then it would be people can finance their houses, refinance their houses, you know, do home loans, all, all sorts of things. So that would be my, my comment about that. So Bruce, do you want to take a minute and talk about the, I, I think it's an important part of what's going on out here. So you want to just talk a little bit? Describe where it is for those that don't know, most probably do. I won't sit in the front row again. <laughs> Uh, my name is Bruce Hall, and I work for the Bonner Development Group. Uh, BDG Incorporated in 1994 is a non-for-profit, and we have a num number of projects that we've worked on. Uh, one of the first projects are, uh, that, that we undertook was uh, uh, the creation of a park from land that was donated to, to BDG by Champion International in 1994. And then this would really benefit from having some visuals, which I have none because I did not know I was going to be doing this this morning or this afternoon. But... Um, uh, we, uh, as I mentioned, we acquired the property in 1994. It's about 25 acres of ground. Uh, since the removal of the dam, we've actually acquired land because much of the land was under, underneath the reservoir. And so for, the, for those of you who know where the, uh, where the uh, old Milwaukee caboose is, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, that's how you access it, so it's back there. So if you walk out of the Bonner School, you're about five minutes to the park. Uh, to, I guess to describe the park a little bit, uh, again, 25 acres, it's got a half mile of developed walking trail. There's a, a picnic pavilion out there that's quite nice. We have a sealed vault toilet on site and some other nice amenities, um, some park benches and a viewing scope out there. Um, the park's currently closed. Well, let, let's see, let me back up. So 1994, uh, the park was a, uh, the, the property was actually an abandoned uh, gravel pit that, uh, the DOT had used in creation of the, when they were building the interstate. And so we went through a process of reclaiming that property. And so we had built a park in there, and which was open to the public like in 19, I, I guess like 1995, maybe 96. and was open for a few years. And then in 2006, it was closed because of parks that was used as mobilization by Envirocon when they took the dam out. So the park has been closed since 2006. And uh, we had hoped that it would open in 2010, and then we hoped that it would open in 2011, and hoped that it would open in 2012. And now we're hoping that it'll, it'll open in 2017. We're hoping. Uh, one of the reasons that it is closed 
is uh, it's pending uh, approval of EPA performance standards for vegetation on the site. And so uh, what we did, though, we entered into a memorandum of understanding with the Bonner School in 2009 that allowed Bonner students to use that site under supervision with their teachers. And so quite a few of the teachers do take their students in there and with the hope that this would become a, a learning park for the community. The directors of BDG felt like the, uh, the, the best fate for the park was to keep it in local ownership and local governance. And as a result of that thinking, we, we've entered into discussions with the school about acquiring the park. The school is currently working through its due diligence to take the park as, in, as part of an extension of the, of the school's campus. So that's kind of where, where we sit right now with the park. It, we're just kind of, what do they say in the Army? Hurry up and wait. So that's kind of what we're doing. Um, Perfect. Enough? Perfect. Any questions? Any questions? <laughs> Oh, well, you did great. You did. Uh, any questions for us? For uh, is Darren still here? No, he left. Oh, okay. Uh, for Patrick, any questions for Patrick? <coughs> Boy, that's unusual. Where are you getting your containers? Well, mostly uh, on the west coast in Seattle and Portland, and I mean, really? that's what's great about the the containers as a building material is that there's so many, um, so many of them here in the United States uh, because of our, our trade deficit. So many um, containers come into the United States and much less leave every year. So um, there's just kind of an oversupply of some containers that just sit here in the United States unused. So, you know. Does it bring them in by rail for you? Uh, no, no. We we ship them on flatbed trucks. Um, just uh, shipping on rail is just a little bit. Um, more complicated uh, than just shipping them on, on the truck. So. My wife wants me to ask you, <laughs> so what, what are the prices of these? Uh, they are, um, you know, they vary quite a lot um, from, you know, like the red one we had up there, you know, it was in the range of forty to $50,000, including installation. Um, the two-bedroom house was a little bit more like $120,000. Um, so, um, you know, here in Montana, they're not necessarily a cost-effective solution compared to a stick building, but in a place like Seattle, um, the cost to construct is very, very high. And so in these places where housing is really expensive, we can be really competitive. And so um, our idea is ultimately to be employing people here in, in Montana, building houses uh, for people in places where housing is really expensive. Um, and so we build them here, ship them out uh, to place, places like New York City where um, a studio apartment is going to rent out for $2,500 to $3,000 a month. And that's, that's, where, that's a lot where all of our customers are coming from. What's the R value in the world? Uh, the R value, we use spray foam insulation, so the R value is very high. Um, you, there are about 22 in the walls. Uh, uh, 30 in the ceiling and 48, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, 30 in the floor and 48 in the ceiling. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, I kind of got a question. Uh, 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 your business, is it going bumper to bumper with like uh, modular homes? How do you compete? We, we are a certified modular home manufacturer. Um, we're already approved, uh, our homes are already, our home designs are already approved in Montana, Washington, and now California. And very soon they're going to be approved in New York and Colorado as well. Um, so we are a modular home manufacturer and our homes go through the same process as any modular uh, home does, manufacturer built home does. Um, and so all of our homes comply with the same building codes as any other home. Um, we just had to figure out how to do it with containers, which happen to be a really great building block for modular construction. So, I guess your selling point is durability. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, when you compare them to a wood-built uh, modular home, uh, there's just a, a lot of benefits to using uh, steel shipping containers. Um, from structural integrity to durability to the aesthetic 
factor that people just love the looks of these these big boxes that were meant to be shipped over the ocean and now they're you know converted into a house people love that and you know obviously the the benefit of recycling materials is also a, a big mm -hmm. selling point. So, thank you yeah. Bruce are they stackable uh, yeah yeah we're doing a, we're doing a two-story model right now actually so yeah yep <laughs> That's why we need those overhead cranes. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Well, I just want to thank. Oh, sorry. I mean, I want to go back to when you were talking about the sewers and stuff. Um, <coughs> what are your guys' perspectives on like like a water treatment plant for Bonner? Partly, what's going to happen with this uh, preliminary engineering report is to determine that. Uh, my understanding is that you could have, uh, help me a little bit, Bruce, but you're not necessarily talking about one great big facility. You might have one on this side of the river, one on the other side, one further down towards East Missoula. What do they call those? Uh, uh, on-site, you have on-site treatment? Uh, yeah, like an on-site uh, facility, smaller facility that, you know, we're not necessarily looking to either hook up or duplicate what they've got in Missoula, the city or whatever, but uh, that's one of the things that this engineering report's going to determine. It's been my understanding that the EPA is encouraging uh, uh, treatment w near the place where the water comes out of the ground mm -hmm. instead right. of running the sewage pipe all the way 10 miles and hoping it gets to a treatment plant that has a problem discharging into the river and then, and then try and replenish water back into the groundwater table. If we can do on site, Encur the EPA is encouraging on site treatment. So I, I think uh, some of the questions that we asked the county of, and that's part of the preliminary engineering review, is uh, maybe five options. One, uh, do nothing. Two, connect to the centralized facility in Missoula. Three, connect to the centralized facility out here. Or um, maybe four, to connect to several centralized facilities around here and I must be forgetting all the other that I say do nothing yeah. you know some of these <clears throat> new treatment facilities are you would looking at them you'd think they're a greenhouse and not a treatment facility uh, I went to one down and by Bozeman looked at it and it was uh, no odor and very little waste comes out of it and uh, it's the same type of design that's going to go in Sealy Lake uh, when they get uh, get that built up there, it's uh, uh, it, you know they always think uh, sewage lagoons and smell and things like that. We're so far beyond that right. anymore. It's, uh, We've kind of used you know in our thinking a little bit the Sealy Lake. Uh, you guys have plowed all that ground and uh, not literally, but you know uh, which has helped us a little bit in thinking about what we're trying to do and and. Uh, and somehow politically you guys have been able to figure out how to get that done and that's not an easy deal to I've been to DC three times for I'm, the sewer. I'm sure you and have it's <laughs> constant work but you know if you keep at it you can do it just like what you've already done you just keep yeah at you it. just if you got to try you're exactly right you just got to nibble away at it and pretty soon you look back and say gee you know we have done something good now congratulations to you guys Gary? You know, I think I might be getting in trouble for doing this, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, this is a good time to bring up a commercial for the Bonner Milltown Community Council, which Steve and, and Bruce are um, uh, serving as committee members of a community council committee and doing this sewer feasibility uh, study approach. But the council has a vacancy. We have a five-member council, and there are only four members now on it. So it needs another member, and uh, sewer feasibility project is a great example of how the council can act as a communicator between the local community and the county and we would love to have another member on our council. Well I would nominate Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> second. I would second that. Hey, done. Yeah, All those in favor? <laughs> yeah. I just uh, I was talking to the uh, county public boards last week and they are in process of getting the consultant for this thing. It uh, should have it by the end of next month. Wow. Um, then the, uh, Greg Robertson, the yep. director of public works, and the consultant will be out to the Bonner Milltown Council 
probably in April for a Q and A and an open discussion of what the what the possibilities are. Awesome. Before we, uh, is everybody done? I would just I, I'll just make a last comment and then you can close it out however you want. I just think if 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 you were to have this group or, or this sort of a function to take place in the city of Missoula with 90 some hundred thousand people, you wouldn't get 10 percent of what we've got here. I mean that that's a tribute to you folks, and it's uh, it's just incredible. I'm always amazed. We have we go to the council, and if anybody's talking, no matter who it is, a whole bunch of people come and I, that are interested in their community and how things go. And you should be very very proud of yourselves. This is and we're proud of ourselves. We we consider ourselves part of this deal now too. So, uh, quick follow up on that. Bonner Mill Town Council meets every second Monday of the month at 7 o'clock in the school. We'd love to see all of you there. Have you ever thought about having an open house over there? Like, instead of having one or two people touring and bothering your tenants, just do it all at once. <laughs> <laughs> and we would like to thank you all for coming out. <laughs> but, <laughs> I do. But to answer that, I I do believe that uh, pedicab, for example, some of them don't want a bunch of people wandering around, you know, uh, and I don't blame them because there's trailers moving and trucks and all that. But I, and I don't know whether Pedicab will open it up to the community or not, but I know they're going to have a grand opening sometime in the spring when they get rolling a little better. And uh, I think it's worth thinking about. We ought to figure out a, a way to, to do that. It would, be, it would be fun. Now, I find that a group, where's Andy? He's right. Andy just shows up with about five or six guys. And he just, <laughs> the next thing you know, he's, we're, we're on a tour, which is, which is awesome. So if anybody gets a little group together and really thinks, you know, would like to look around or whatever, get a hold of my partner. I'm kind of busy. He's not. <laughs> we'll get that handled for you. I do have to uh, say one last thing, and, uh, and this is unknown to the community, but Steve is the self-anointed Baron of Bonner. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Mike and Steve, and uh, as, as we had said before, they are patrons of the Bonner Milton. Just real quick, uh, and this has been, probably been a year in the process, but uh, we are, well, first of all, and Darren is a part of this, but um, he is building two signs, one that will hang out of the History Center, and then also uh, a sign, there's an old sign that belonged to the post office that we're also going to build a frame for to stick out. But also, and I've uh, managed to, um, uh, how can I gently put this? Um, convince, yeah, Finago. <laughs> convince First Security Bank to make a donation to help us construct two entry signs into Bonner. Welcome to the historic Bonner, uh, established 1885. So it just kind of a little recognition for the town and it's in the works. Okay, that's all. That's amazing. It is wonderful. I have just three quick announcements and then we will adjourn. Um, next program is right here on Fe February 21st, 2 o'clock, Scott Keen on the Logging History of Montana. And I have a quiz for you now, so I hope you are um, all paying attention, but this doesn't even have anything to do with our topic. The quiz is for Bill Taylor. When did the Bonner Depot burn? If you know, please see Bill and tell him, because he's writing a book about this. And finally, an announcement for the future from uh, our friends in the, in the Bitterroot. Uh, September 22nd to 24th, 2016, in Hamilton and Stevensville, the Montana History Conference. Uh, it's the 175th anniversary of the founding of St. Mary's Mission. So be watching for more information. I know it'll be coming out in the media. Hooked on Art is February 6th, which is uh, 
two weeks? Saturday, Saturday uh, 10 to 4, Bonner School. There's an art market, there's um, art talks, there's all kinds of student art and food available, so everyone please attend 10 to 4, February 6th. Could you tell everybody what that bright light is in the uh, History Center? Oh, the bright light in the History Center is a generous donation from Harry and Kathy Mead, who bought a home up the Blackfoot and discovered that one of the fixtures was from the Margaret Hotel. And uh, they very generously uh, called us up and said, would you like to have this? And we said, yes, thank you. And so uh, Glenn Smith, our local hooligan, rewired it so it's safe and won't burn our facility down. And it is now hanging in the window. It's illuminated uh, during uh, the evening hours and parts of the daytime. So that is our Hotel Margaret uh, facility er, fixture, which is returned home. Anything else? Thank you so much. Enjoy some uh, conversation and treats. everyone to the Montana Connection again, 1992 Lurback Family Reunion, Lola, Montana. We hope you enjoy this little uh, tape on logging in western Montana. We certainly enjoyed making it for you. Here we are up in the woods. Just backed up to the trailer, he unloaded it there, we're hooking her up now. That gentleman next to me there is uh, the guy we call a knot bumper. His job is to cut off all the excess limbs that are on the logs before they go on the truck. Our day starts at about uh, 3.30 in the morning, 3 o'clock, something on that, uh, depending on which turn you're out. This is the outfit I work for, Hilco Incorporated. They're based right uh, in West Riverside where I live, right close to my house. This is the inside of uh, my truck. It's a 1990 Kenworth conventional powered by a 350 cat engine. This loader is a Prentice uh, 410B. It's a self-propelled hydraulic loader. It's capable of picking up about an 8 to 10,000 pound log and putting it on the truck. Sometimes it has a little trouble doing it, but it uh, does a pretty good job of it. As I was mentioning, our day starts at about 3 to 3.30 in the morning, sometimes 2.30, depending on uh, what turn you're out. And we usually run uh, on the average of about 12 hours a day. Uh, depending on where we're hauling to, it can amount to as much as uh, 15 to 16 hours in a day. We have a little extra time while we're loading there for a little snack, a cup of coffee or something like that. Kind of sit and chat a little bit, as you can see. We just moved down the road for another deck here and we're going to load out of that deck now. We cleaned up the last one. The outfit I work for has 22 logging trucks that they uh, have on the road. Uh, generally uh, all are working. At this point there is a couple that are being repaired right now but as a whole about 22 logging trucks are running out of this one outfit here that I work for. Quite a number of logging outfits in town. There's one outfit too that uh, hauls for Champion. Also, he has somewhere around 55 logging trucks. Of course, half his logging trucks are in Idaho and Washington, but uh, he has quite a few that are hauling here and in, uh, in this area too. Getting to the bottom of the pile here, we're going to be moving down the road here in just a second and picking up another deck. Cats bring these logs off the hill. They skid them off the hill after the Sawyer's cut them and put them in the decks along the road here and then we come by and pick them up later. Now here you're going to get an idea of what this knot bumper does here. He takes care of these excess limbs you see on the logs there before they go on the truck. Wrapping up the load now, we got our load on. We got to wrap her up here. We got to put two wrappers on. 
in Idaho you have to have three, but in Montana you only need two unless you uh, have uh, a short log someplace so that you can't cover with the two wrappers and you're going to have to use a third one. But you need to have all the logs on top of the load covered. All the short logs have to be, have a wrapper on each end of it. If you don't and you get caught going down the highway by the Mr. Highway Patrolman, then it costs you 50 or $65 to pay the bill. And that comes out of my pocket, and I don't really hear you care for that too much. Wrappers are pretty close together here. Apparently we had an eight-foot log up on top, so we have to cover both ends, as I said. And that's why you see the wrappers are so close together. Generally, you have them a little bit farther apart than that. Kind of makes me a little mad when he puts that little short log right on top. You have to shake him up a little bit, I guess. Here we are at Pablo, Montana. This is about an 80-mile trip we just made. Max was great company on this run. Uh, this is up in the middle of the Mission Valley, which is a very beautiful valley. We have some beautiful rocky, high rocky mountains that we uh, drive alongside of, a lot of uh, reservoirs and things. It's really quite a beautiful trip up there. It takes about two to two and a half hours from the time I'm loaded to get to this uh, particular mill. And like I mentioned, it's about an 80 mile trip from, uh, from the woods. The whole round takes well, pretty close to four to four and a half hours until I'm back into the woods for the next load. This unit here is called a Laternal. He can pick that whole load off in uh, one bite. There's about uh, roughly 27 tons of logs there that he'll be picking off there. And uh, once he gets them off, he takes them over and puts them in an area where uh, we have a log sorting machine that will sort them by species. And then uh, when he gets them all sorted, then he'll come and pick them back up again and put them in the proper log deck. This unit is uh, electric over diesel motor. And it's driven on all four wheels independently. It's a very real large cable that uh, runs that forklift unit and they have been known to break before. Usually when they break is when they get the lo load of logs right off the truck and get them to the highest point and then the whole thing comes down onto the truck. So consequently uh, the mill buys a new truck for the owner. We're back on the scales weighing out again. We have to weigh in loaded and then weigh out uh, empty to get the, you know, the proper payload. Go up this little window here and, oh, where's that gal at? Uh, I guess I'll have to go inside and find her. She's supposed to be there to help me. Generally have a gal or a person that takes care of the weighing and they mark the tickets for you and then uh, give you the stub. This is a trailer loader. We pull underneath there, we unhook our hoses, drop that hook down and pick the trailer up in the air to a certain height, back underneath it, and load her back on the truck and away we go again. This uh, particular trailer loader is quite slow so we can usually go over to, to the local restaurant there and have a hamburger while we're waiting for it to come down and go back up again. Not really, but that's about how slow it is. Just got to do a reversal of what we did up in the woods there. You got to just unhook everything and wrap her back up here and, and then pick the hose up or pick the, pick the trailer back up and put her in the air here. While we're in the woods, that loader uh, reaches down and grabs that long cable you see right there. He just grabs a hold with the grapples and picks the trailer off and he just pull out from under it and he sets her back on the road and we just back up to it. So it's really quite simple. See how slow this thing is? You gotta lay a stick down to see if it moves. We generally stand behind this little barricade here for safety reasons. And these things have been known to break, the cables have been known to break, and boy, they sure don't feel good when they big old trailers land on top of you. And that trailer weighs about 6,000, oh, 100 or 200 pounds. And when they come down, they come down with quite a bang. 
I had one one time and it was just picked off me and I was almost ready to pull out from under it and the uh, cable broke on the loader and it dropped right into the cradle on the truck and I almost went through the top of the cab. There's where we do, just back underneath it and now we'll just load her back on the truck again. Just carry a piggyback back to the woods. Saves on the tires and a lot easier ride too. Them things ride awful rough when they're empty without the trailer loaded on them. Yeah, I think we about got our lunch done. The trailer ought to be just about back onto the truck by now. Well, that's the way you load it back on. Raise it back up a little bit so it don't hit the guy in the windshield when he comes under, and it's back to the woods. Here we are, heading up the mountainside empty. Awful dusty, isn't it? <laughs> this is called a switchback. I just went around there because it does just what it says. It switches back into the opposite direction that you just came up the hill. Back up for load number two, and the same loader, putting them back on the truck again. This is my second load, I'll have to come back from one more. I'll have three loads this day. the front end of that loader, it's uh, self-propelled like I mentioned before. Uh, the operator drives it right from that little cab he's operating the shovel from. It's all uh, remote control from there. He can lift his outriggers, he can uh, travel up and down the road, steer it, whatever he wants right from the cab. Come on Max, we've got to move. This is looking across the canyon from where we're loading. It's uh, Lolo Peak and Lantern Peak over there. This is about the middle of May we're looking at this, 1992. Quite a bit of snow up there yet, but not near what uh, there usually is. Matter of fact, this is a real low snow year. Here we are coming back down around that same switchback with our 80,000 pound payload. A lot of people ask me, how do you keep that truck going up and down the road with all that weight behind you? And like I always tell them, you just point the front end down the hill and the trailer will follow. You notice how nice it comes around there and just follows us on down. Little mishap on the way down here. Once in a while this does happen. The log slipped off the top there and dropped down so we had to take her loose and rewrap her up again. This is one of the easier ones. Most of the time you can't get your cables loose from the logs because all the weight hanging in the cables. So this unfortunately hung up on the tire there and stayed up in the air to where we was able to get the wrappers off it. So we got it all wrapped up now we all, have to, all we have to do is just back up and kick her loose there and we'll be heading on down the road. And try to back up and I'll get the trailer brake off you nut you'll probably make her. There we go. Back we go. Just kick the thing over the way there yeah get her out of the way. It's doing all right. This is the road we go up. We have to open and close this gate in both directions. It's uh, a closed area to the public for game management. Uh, keep the people from molesting the game or chasing them around up there with their cars and motorcycles and things. Here we are at the Bonner Complex. Uh, this is the barricade where we take the cables loose off the load. And this is the outfit I was telling you about earlier. That's the Wagner. It's a uh, smaller in proportion to the Laternal, but at the same time it's a lot more powerful and picks the load off a lot quicker. We just pull out from behind that barricade after we get the wrappers off, just sit in the truck and he just comes over and picks it off us and that's all it takes. 
Instead of that mountain over there, a lot of times when we're in here uh, unloading, uh, particularly in the spring and winter time, uh, there's a lot of mountain sheep over there. We get to spend a lot of time watching them uh, when we're loading our trailers or unloading our logs. And generally they have their little ones over there too. See elk up in there apparently uh, from time to time and uh, quite a lot of deer too. This is actually right across the river that you're looking at from the mill. There's a big river that runs right uh, just over the bank from us here. It's called the Blackfoot River and it uh, ties into the Clark Fork River just down the canyon about another mile or so and uh, form, forms the Clark Fork River. You notice how fast he came up with that load? Quite a bit faster than the other one, wasn't it? That's all it is. We just head around now over to the trailer loader again, load our trailer back on, and we'll head back for load number three. Here again, we just do the reverse thing of what we did up in the woods. And we gotta pull these extensions out of our stakes up there because uh, if you don't, you go into the underpasses there in town and they hook up and of course they're over heights and it'll unload your trailer right on the highway there and the city police are, get very upset when you do that. So does your boss because it costs quite a few thousand dollars worth of damage most of the time when them things happen. It might even cost you your job. The mountain you see right behind us, that road right up there in the rocks there, comes right down behind my house just around the corner from where we're at here. I live just about a half mile from this mill. South of that work for I was mentioning a little earlier, I think I walk about 200 feet from my back door to the climb in my log truck and go to work. So it's really quite convenient. No expenses. Don't have to drive anywhere. Matter of fact, I just have to go start my pickup once in a while to see if it's still alive. Here we are back and back under it again. I'm gonna set her back on and we're gonna head up for load number three. Beautiful day in western Montana, isn't it? And so there it is, and as we mentioned before, it's back to the woods. It's quite different from this type of log in here, isn't it? Here, these are horse-drawn, and the old type of uh, loaders that they used to have there uh, were a lot uh, less convenient than what we have today. All the logging was pretty much hand-done. As you can see here, a lot of hand-logging, hand hand-loading. And these things were floated down this river, which was right next to where we was loading our trailer there. The same mountain you see in the background, they had to float the logs down and that's the end of her. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it.